I want to thank uh, the University of Utah for supporting this forum and, and uh, my opportunity to participate in it. I really appreciate it very much. Um, whether a non-native speaker, whether a non-native speaker is uh, faking a claim about his or her second language proficiency is a common concern of linguists. Um, is the defendant becoming uh, being truthful or deceitful? And as always, when testifying, we must consider both sides of an issue. Can what a person said or wrote constitute valid evidence and legal statements in a confession? If the person is being deceitful, uh, the language testing is problematic um, if the speaker decides to shut down or if the speaker tries to manipulate the testing or interview situation, it really becomes Quite. Uh, uh, due process uh, is also becomes a concern uh, when trying to determine truthfulness about a defendant's claims about own English proficiency in recorded language evidence during legal procedures. When, for example, when Mirandized and given police caution before property search, we've already heard a lot about this from other speakers when determining need for interpreter, when interviewed and interrogated, uh, when confessing uh, and during a trial, and even when consulting with one's own attorney. And even if you testify in court that it's highly likely uh, that the defendant is not faking, be prepared to answer this question. Have you considered the possibility that the defendant was faking that he or she did not uh, understand much or any English. You will probably be asked this in court, and it also to consider this question helps to reinforce objectivity uh, in your analysis. But will the judge and the jury believe you? All right. Um, now, when uh, before we, I'd like to. Uh, at, uh, what is faking by non-native speakers in forensic contexts, especially in language situations? In law enforcement, uh, faking is used. Malingering comes from psychology, from feigning, being deceitful, untruthful. But I haven't felt that these were language-based enough. Bill Eggington and I, in discussion with others too, tried redefining it for language performance. Um, language assessment, underperforming, uh, but we needed the elements of motivation, the intention to deceive for legal advantage by non-native speakers. Um, but I don't remember who was involved at the time that I finally had my uh, aha moment. But the phrase intentional underperformance seemed to work. Intentional is important because it distinguishes, uh, dis dis distinguishes uh, performance from general underperformance, which could be the result of stressful conditions, exhaustion, coping, etc. It's a bit of a mouthful, and a prosecutor kept tripping over the phrase in a hearing. The judge asked if I would accept faking. Yes, if the assumption of intentionality is being made. But addressing intention or lack of uh, intention can be a mine, uh, landmine in court. We have to be careful about that. Addressing the faking is a multi-layered task. First, it's not unidimensional. Uh, language is one window into the mind, but faking is not a single mental cognitive construct. Uh, and also, as we all know, language is also a means of communication and social interaction. And that includes the cultural background that the uh, speaker brings. Uh, also addressing uh, the a concept of uh, faking uh, is uh, not unidirectional with just the expert doing the analysis and reporting it to the court or the jury or to the fact finders. The linguistics expert reporting directly, no. The linguistics expert has to get through the prosecutor who is uh, pushing back and uh, doing his job, his or her job pushing back. Uh, also uh, might be talking about, uh, might be bringing in myths 
uh, might be talking about added, uh, taking positions that would draw on the uh, attitudes of the uh, fact finders, uh, attitudes that is about non-native speakers and about their language, and and bringing in myths that we uh, uh, that many of us have about uh, non-native speakers, and uh, will use the prosecutor may use those myths. Uh, so and also the concept that. Uh, the, the jury or fact finders might have the idea that faking is bad somehow because the person has been, uh, it's been claimed that that person was faking. And that gives a negative impression uh, of the defendant to begin with. So um, again, the prosecutor's role is to prove the case against the defendant. And the defense is to be, uh, be prepared to argue against challenges. And as a linguistics expert, I'm thinking, I'm not being believed, but I am being scientific. Um, and my expertise in the court, I've come in with expertise from second language acquisition, sociolinguistics, and language assessment. Like experts in other forensic sciences, linguists look for patterns of consistency and inconsistency. And we are looking uh, in for consistencies in language development and in discourse in non-native speaker data. In order to uh, look for patterns and inconsistencies, um, I feel like I need at least two significant samples to look for these uh, patterns. Um, and we're looking at, uh, for example, language evidence in the case. You have wiretap, video, police reports, relevant legal documents, and so on. However, be careful that these are not valid samples for formal language assessment. The conditions under which they are, are recorded uh, or collected are not the, the conditions that are acceptable for uh, a formal official language assessment. However, there is other language data that can be brought in, and that, that is the data from the language assessment, data from the experts' uh, non-testing interview, uh, data from additional tasks, and some of the language assessment arrangements might be same test, two different forms at different times, but not back to back or phone or by phone. Uh, sometimes attorneys might want to have you do it by phone and that is a no-no. Um, also the same test, two different raters, same place or distant with recording. Uh, and I've uh, also, I've had this, this situation in a case. Um, also the language test A and language test B, different tests, but with the same examiner. And there may be a additional appropriate assessments um, type assessment tasks uh, to increase the relevance um, of the um, of your assessment to the final legal question. Uh, and so when you're considering possible faking low language proficiency, ask how valid or relevant were the assessments to the relevant communications in the case? Accepted tests, tests usually are not, even if they're standardized. Therefore, it's not enough. Usually those tests are developed for large populations and, and for other purposes. Therefore, it's really not enough just to stay with that one, uh, um, one test and use that. Uh, there are additional, you want to add additional appropriate assessment tasks to increase the relevance. You want to examine the quality of the language samples and the evidence, and you want to examine the effect of myths before you begin thinking of looking at uh, the, um, the implications for the general linguistic and general and legal questions. Legal question. Uh, Evidence argumentation is common in the legal field. Uh, and, and attorneys understand and uh, judges understand about uh, evidence argumentation, uh, going for the evidence to the legal question. Uh, and also in language assessment field, uh, when the development of language tests, uh, the language develop assessment developer needs to look at what they want the test to be able to predict. Um, the, the legal question, such as, you know, parallel with the legal question. And then they go back and look at the evidence that they, the, the way they can gather it, what kind of evidence can they gather from a, a test? And uh, is the test, uh, a single test is probably not gonna be sufficient, but they need to uh, look at uh, what else they might need to add in order to get to uh, 
the legal question or, or the key linguistic question. Um, so you may need to add some other tasks in between. We'll look at three cases involving uh, faking issues. Uh, one is a case mot uh, motivating my focus on faking. Uh, one is an alternating language story retell task. <clears throat> and then I'd like to refer briefly to a language acquisition research, the influence of that on a case. And then I'd like to close with a response to a very common myth. Uh, the, uh, this case number one that I'm going to tell, tell you about motivated me to look more closely at the faking issue and to begin developing some strategies. First case, um, I was evaluating data from the other side, from the prosecution. Uh, typically, I uh, uh, called and asked to work on uh, with the defense attorneys, uh, but occasionally I have an opportunity to be on the other side. In this case, uh, to be working with uh, with an attorney on the other side. Uh, here we have a highway stop. There was a suspicious car, a passenger interpreted for the police, and a Spanish L1 driver. Um, the um, then they the police said he was free to go. And as he walked away, the police called out on a simple question in English. The driver automatically responded in English. The police thought, gotcha. So the canine unit was brought in with 30 pounds of uh, heroin in the trunk of a car, it was taken into custody. And at the station, a police caution, <clears throat> the Miranda was given in Spanish by a police officer who's a Spanish second language speaker and was also in written, uh, a written version, uh, a written Spanish version was given. And he was arrested. The attorney arranged an uh, English language testing at a local adult ed center and uh, also for Spanish reading testing at a local university. In, uh, in this federal crime for drug trafficking, the federal district attorney asked me to look at the language assessment data, low scores supporting a claim of low proficiency in oral English and Spanish reading. There were two forms of adult literacy tests, of a single adult literacy test given back to back, or pictures, multiple choice, circle the correct answer. His scoring was uh, low, but very random answers. Probably, I thought, a manipulated test. Also, the test was not valid. It was a pen and pencil uh, basic literacy task, that, and we were trying to look at the communication uh, that took place in a highway, uh, oral communications in a highway traffic stop. So I asked to see all the original testing materials, uh, the completed sc uh, score sheets, and so on. Uh, also, uh, there was a locally developed Spanish reading test for placing freshmen into Spanish one or higher. And uh, his score on this was very low. The Spanish professor, professor asked if the defendant helped his children with their homework in Mexico, for example, reading. And, the, and I thought this was kind of an interesting question. The defendant cried about missing his children. The professor wrote that such a man wouldn't be deceptive about English and Spanish abilities. Give the man an Oscar. At least that's what I wanted to put this to say, but I couldn't put that in my report. <clears throat> I also reviewed the examiner's uh, assessment qualifications and assessment methods, and they were very weak. Um, I was criticizing probably very well-meaning people in my field. I started thinking more about the faking issue uh, and waited for a new case uh, that would fit an idea I had. Case two. Uh, there's a road trip involving driver Chang and, a, and her passenger. It was a road trip that ended in a traffic stop, questions, no audio or video. That's because the ca video cam was broken in, in, the, uh, in the repair shop. Uh, it was a partial search of the car, uh, car trunk, and question was, was this legal? Uh, flight, uh, in a car chase like you would see in, in a, on TV in a, uh, or on the movies in a car chase. Um, the car goes crack, flying off the ramp uh, into a field. Um, in the crash, the, drug, the trunk of the car pops open and the drugs are, fall out and they're in plain sight. She and the a passenger were arrested but separately, uh, taken into custody separately. And um, she ended up in jail, in the hospital before she was sent to jail. 
Now, Driver Chang, when she was questioned in the traffic stop, how much did she know about the drugs or did she understand what was happening, uh, communications, interactions with the police? As I said before, there's no audio or video from the traffic stop. Video cam was broken. Also, how much did she depend on the LEO's law enforcement officers' nonverbal communications pointing to the back of the trunk, uh, to, to the back of the car, or pointing to the uh, glove compartment? Um, and also, it became the LEO's word about events and about her language compre comprehension, about how much he thought she understood against Chang's own word about her comprehension. Remembering that language is one window into the mind, how can we try to sneak into the mind of someone who might be faking and allow a natural language proficiency to emerge if not faking? And also ground that um, technique in relevant research for acceptance in the court and not depend primarily on ad hoc tasks. And I was uh, influenced by Ellen Bialystok's work in cognitive psychology and a widely used story retail task for teaching and testing. In my assessment protocol, <clears throat> at least, uh, I had to come up with well, these. In my, I decided it was better to have, well, normally, uh, let me restate, restate this. Normally, it's better to have more than one language sample in English but I only had one chance to test her in Fort Leavenworth Detention Center in Kansas. Uh, and I also had uh, correctional system uh, recordings of her telephone calls she had made in, in, in jail. So uh, only Chinese and Mandarin were on it and an, uh, and an unknown, a uh, Chinese um, Mandarin and an unknown Chinese di uh, dialect. And I, it took me a while to find someone who could help me identify it. Uh, uh, on the prison call, but and there were a few English words like for operating, uh, making a phone call. Her cellmates had taught her and to understand like like stop or you have one minute left or something like that. Um, and I really wanted to find get her uh, home language, her language of the heart, so to speak, so that when I did the task, she was not having to mediate it through Mandarin. I wanted it to be straight into her. Uh, into, into her brain. So the uh, assessment pr pr protocol had an oral proficiency interview as a modified ACFA-like OPI, uh, thus meeting the court standards. Um, and I had a, I created this alternating language retail task. Um, and I wanted to access her, access her possible English in another way, uh, rather than in, in addition to the test. And I wanted to create a task in which it might be more difficult to fake a proficiency. The development of this was very labor intensive uh, since I needed to get her first, uh, her home dialect and have all this done in her home dialect as well as English. And it had to be principled based on research. Um, an alternating story retail task. Um, she, uh, this is recorded to listen to a story with two related storylines about the same top general theme. It was told in alternating pattern in two languages, Chinese Fuzhou and uh, English. And alternating back and forth of a few sentences in one language of this storyline and then a few sentences in the other language uh, in English of the second storyline. Common theme but different storylines. Then the defendant retold the story in uh, first language, Fuzhou. So uh, you had Chinese input and English input and what was going to come out in her Chinese retail. Would there be any English information from the English storyline that would stay in memory and that would come out in her storyline and when, when told in Chinese? And the results were consistent with my own ACFA-like uh, assessment of novice low. I had also added a children's jigsaw puzzle uh, for more language and also to produce the uh, effect of short time uh, memory between the time uh, she heard the story and did the retell. And this is an idea I got from Yuko Butler, University of Pennsylvania. 
Later, I replicated, um, well, at the advice of my uh, the, uh, federal defense attorney uh, that was involved in this case, uh, he advised that I do more research on it. He liked the task, uh, but he said do more research. So I replicated the um, alternating story retell with 18 subjects and I added a faking task. This is something I did after the first case was over, uh, but uh, in a, in a couple of years later. So in addition to tweaking and replicating the retail task, I compared this uh, subject's uh, retails with per their performance on the best plus oral proficiency assessment. It's an adult, uh, uh, adult level uh, oral proficiency test. And I asked two subjects that sounded like strong intermediate level speakers uh, to pretend to be drug dealers. I, when I was calling to each of these sub, uh, my uh, 18 possible uh, participants, I, um, it sounded like they, on the phone, it sounded like they had fairly strong uh, English. So I asked them to pretend to be drug dealers and try to fake a lower than truthful proficiency. And I wanted them to um, try to sort of be look sound like they were cooperating with the police, but at the same time, uh, keep a low proficiency and claim, a, claim that they didn't understand or that they really had trouble with their English. They were unsuccessful at significantly lowering their performance level. One of them lowered it up about a half uh, one level and the other one lowered it only a half a level on the uh, best plus oral test. And they used different strategies. One of them, uh, one that lowered it one level, pretended to be a, it changed his personality, became a, a tough drug dealer and tried to sound like one. And the other one, uh, the woman who did this, uh, only lowered it a half a level, but she tried to be sort of cautious and very, very slow and deliberate at what she was trying to say in English. So this is important. They use different strategies. So we cannot, we, we should be very cautious about claiming that there is a single strategy for faking. Um, for these two uh, in that test. As you can see, they both had been in the United States for quite some time, and they both had high proficiency, uh, sort of a, uh, on the best plus test, they were, uh, had a, uh, on a scale of, uh, they had eight and seven and eight and, and nine and a scale of zero to 10. So that's fairly strong. And they both recognized that there were two storylines, but what they did with those information was still, um, they still didn't significantly, they couldn't, they couldn't get rid of the information that they had and pretend to, uh, they couldn't pretend well, I should say that, not get rid of the information, that's incorrect. They couldn't pretend in the test to drop their level and become significantly lower. They didn't know what they needed to change um, in order to be that much lower. And there was just too, their English was too strong. Uh, so uh, finally in case three, uh, I'll do this very briefly, um, knowledge of second language acquisition came to the, uh, research came to the rescue. Um, there, was, uh, there was a myth they had to overcome where the um, uh, police officer said it was that mixing in Spanish and English helps. Uh, and there was their flawed legal evidence. So I'm going to address the flawed legal evidence. The prosecutor said, see the defendant's story on page 19? He told his story in his own words as he was asked to. That proves that he was faking a lower, low proficiency in your assessments. And it, my reaction was that the defendant's lengthy statement reflects language that is not consistent with his assessed abilities. There's no effective communication no evidence of ability to perform the task, no control of grammar. And it is not consistent, and it is not consistent, that should be, cons it is not consistent, uh, I have inconsistent. It was not consistent with first and second language development research. I then ask, so where did the statement of 220 words, 16 sentences, mostly compound and complex sentences, 30 main verbs, correct use of all irregular and irregular past tense verbs. Where did all of that come from? I could not make a claim 
uh, that the police that there had been mediated by the police officer who wrote the report. I just left the question out there. So I'd like to close with a common myth used to challenge um, uh, not fake, uh, likely not fake, my, a claim of not likely not faking. Uh, and the, I was testifying in a hearing on a motion to suppress evidence in the case of a defendant I had assessed at a low intermediate level an SPL 4 out of 10. The pros prosecution questioning my assessment said, how do you know he wasn't faking a lower English proficiency? After the court recess, um, the opposing attorney immediately started by reading this aloud as I'm going to do it. And I ask your patience. Um, you, uh, I, I, hereby, I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom I, or which I have heretofore been a subject or sentence citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by the law, that I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by the law, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of ev evasion, so help me God. You know what this is, he asked me. Yes, I think it's the oath of allegiance. I knew where he was going, but I didn't say anything more. I just waited. Dr. Van Arsen, that's pretty advanced language, wouldn't you agree? So if a person takes that oath, it must mean he understood what it means and has an advanced level of proficiency. So you, he wouldn't need an interpreter, wouldn't you agree? After all, he's a US citizen. So he must have been faking that he didn't understand the police officer. Also, he passed the citizenship test. As linguists, I'm sure you're thinking, and legal practitioners, you're thinking of responses, uh, but I have no time to report mine or to discuss these at this moment. Uh, the prosecution's statements pointed, however, to a myth, one of many folk beliefs, beliefs that are used to offset the best, best efforts of linguistic and language assessment experts to have uh, their expert analyses accepted by the court and the jury. Uh, Winterstrom, um, has uh, collected theories about for denying interpreters uh, that are used for denying interpreters. And I've also been collecting myths myself. And I uh, like hers in particular. Here, the, there's the Americans all speak English theory in the tri trial, uh, in, the, in, the, in the judge's opinion, uh, Gonzalez was a naturalized US citizen. Uh, this is a data she collected for many uh, uh, from many uh, judicial opinions, from about 34 judicial opinions. And um, we do know that the person who, when they become a citizen, have learned some English. But language is not like a water faucet. Uh, you don't just turn it on when a person becomes a citizen and out comes a full flow. And I want to acknowledge Green, uh, Mel Greenlee's uh, uh, comment, uh, this particular comment. She's here in the audience. Lingu linguistic analyses and assessments are not always enough to break through a myth and a sincerely held belief. Um, it is not enough to testify how likely it is whether a person is faking a lower than truthful proficiency. We need to be prepared to take down the myth that might be blocking fact finders from listening to you, from really listening to you. And these little uh, um, flying carpet icons are my uh, icon for a myth. And we know that uh, uh, Mertzen, uh, Ford, and Matosian have also pointed to the dilemma faced in, by the social scientists in, uh, in terms of the law and in the court. Uh, and linguistics is, con while it's a science, it's uh, under suspect in the court because, because social sciences are not seen as having the same degree of certainty as can be found in natural sciences. So as professionals in these fields, we have to keep con continuing to justify uh, what we do in court. So I began uh, 
filling my expandable backpack with myth busters. So what appropriate tasks and information can I add when developing evidence argumentation to challenge myths? Um, there is the uh, a recent TESOL convention in Chicago. I attended the sessions that were held by the Department of Homeland Security, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. And I urge you to check with your regional district for the community, community relations officer. Take a workshop. Very informative. And, and it broke one of the myths I had about, uh, about the citizenship test. Um, I used to think that this, uh, the civics part of the test uh, was a, a, a read and multiple choice pen and pencil test, but it's not. Um, also, there's a citizenship uh, testing related research. Um, here's a sampling uh, at the AAAL conference then, this past spring in, in Chicago. Uh, uh, there was research on raise, uh, by uh, Firahim and Loring, and it was on raise your right hand and repeat after me, the performance of the U.S. naturalization oath of allegiance. And also Paula Winke, the University of Michigan, um, has uh, done a study of the uh, civics component of the U.S. naturalization test, and she's very strong in her psychometrics of it in, second, in language testing. I won't go over this, but these are the basic components of the naturalization test. Uh, there, uh, just very briefly, there are. Uh, the civics, uh, civics test is this main spoken test, and there are two short reading and writing tasks, uh, and there's an oral interview. Uh, the oral interview is based on a very difficult uh, form, appli the application form for citizenship. Um, and if there are, you have any inconsistencies in that, uh, becomes a problem. Uh, but it's, um, but the uh, other two, the other three tasks are tied to, um, uh, the uh, national ratings uh, system of the uh, SPL rating scales that I've mentioned before. And the uh, uh, civics test is tied to roughly a level four out of 10 and, um, and on the SPL. And the other two are closer to a, uh, NRS uh, SPL three. However, I'm still ver uh, I'm, uh, I'm verifying that these two labels are interchangeable with the my contact at Homeland uh, Security. Um, the, uh, we're looking at uh, candidates for, for U.S. citizenship that uh, can get by. It's a fairly low bar of uh, uh, comprehension. For the most part, a three out of 10 uh, high beginning ESL speaking in speaking and listening anyway. Individual can understand common words, simple phrases, sentences containing familiar vocabulary, spoken slowly with some repetition, and so on can answer, respond to simple questions about everyday activities, uh, using learned, uh, simple learned phrases or short sentences. Shows They show limited control of grammar. Is this strong enough to uh, have no need for an interpreter? So given this data, I feel like uh, the citizenship myth has been busted and the language that comes out will only be coming out in a drop by drop by drop for some for some applicants. Okay, thank you.